we begin our another sermon in our Acts series. As you have bulletins, you in there you'll find our slides in there for each slide in there, so you don't even have to write it down. Uh, I made it a little easy for you. You kind of know where we're going. So we think about the last few chapters from three to five. Uh, we kind of think through this faith idea, what it means to have faith uh, for the apostles and the disciples and the newfound disciples that are following uh, these apostles that have followed Jesus and, and found a way, found what it means uh, to follow this resurrected Jesus Christ. It is amazing to see their faith, their boldness. Think about last sermon. They're praying for boldness to speak, to speak in a time where they're going to be killed just to speak the name of Jesus. But how can they deny it? They just witnessed a man for over 40 years being lame, sitting at the temple, and now can walk. Not just walk, but skip and run and stand there professing the truth. So now they have all the reason to be bold and courageous to do this. And God will accomplish this through them. That's what their prayer is for. That's the purpose of their prayer. That's the reality they're preaching in. And that is the time to have it done. So we live in a time where we see many people do lots of things to be seen by others. Anybody notice that? I mean, everyone wants to be seen, right? TV, everybody's got a YouTube channel. Everybody's got a podcast that is a YouTube channel. Everyone wants to be seen. Everybody does something to be seen. News channel, everybody runs out to do something. Oh, it's a news channel. Oh, hello, I'm right here. Always to be seen and noticed. Whether they're doing right or wrong, they want to be noticed for what they're doing. That is the reality. Just to be seen and noticed. Which, you know, it's easy to get on a soapbox right there. Because we're about to talk to you about today, we're talking about doing right things, right? Doing right things and being noticed. Doing good, charitable things. Look what I'm doing. I'm doing good, charitable things. Notice me. It's good. But you have also people in the world who want to be noticed for doing wrong things. And same noticed people want to be noticed, right? Social media has it all over the place. All over the place. See me. See me for what I'm doing. Come notice me right now. Oh, I don't want to be, I don't need any credit for this. Selfie. I'm giving money to the poor. Selfie. You see what I'm saying? Like, this is, this is the reality. This is where we live in. It's not new. I mean, we've seen Jesus speak about it, didn't we? He spoke about it. More than once. It's no longer a private moment. It's no longer a goodwill or a charity. It's... Hey, everybody, come look at me. I am giving this away. I'm doing this. But we're also wired to want praise. We're also wired to desire to have honor and, you know, that type of pat on the back. This desire is understandable. It's human. It's not new. It's not a new problem for culture either. It's been happening since the beginning of time. Even Satan wanted more praise and glory than God. Spoiler alert, that's why he got kicked out of heaven, in case anybody didn't know. The whole reality of what's going on is caused by that fall. We see in Acts 4-5, through we see this issue come up again, more and more. We're seeing the apostles act in such a way they don't need credit. They don't want credit. They just want to do what's best. And here, at the end of 4 and 5, we're seeing people act in the right way, not looking for praise, not looking for glory, just doing the right thing. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to see people wanting to do just honor God and Him alone. 
But we're also going to talk about people who want to honor themselves. Come in and say, oh, praise Jesus. But at the same time, do it all for show. Because they've seen somebody else get a pat on the back. And they did such thing. So we're going to see that. But we'd rather see in this chapter 4, you know, end of 4 and part of 5, see the honor and glory of God in Him alone. So let's read the scripture today, which is 432 through 511 in its entirety. So 432 through 511. Now the entire group, note that word, entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of these, his possessions was his own. But instead, they held everything in common. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was on all of them. For there was not a need, needy person among them, because all of those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as any had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, Ananias, and his wife, uh, Seph, um, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter, uh, Peter said, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and kept back part of the proceeds of the land? Wasn't it your, yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it yours at disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have lied, not lied to the people, but to God. When he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead, and a great fear came over all who had heard. The young man got up and wrapped his body and carried him out, and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter, tell me, Peter asked her, did you sell the land for this price? Yes, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Instantly, she dropped dead to, at his feet. When the young men came in, they found her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Then great fear came on the whole church, on all who heard these things. This is the scripture that we have today. I mean, a real just, I mean, exciting piece of scripture, and it? it just brings just warm and fuzzies to your heart. Uh, well, part of it does. Part of it's kind of exciting. And the other part is kind of a, a misunderstood piece of Scripture, I would say. A lot of people misunderstand that second part of the Scripture. But let's talk about the first portion. The first part is meant to be a family. Meant to be a family. And if you're a Ray Ramon type of guy, if you like that show, uh, think about this. His older brother loved the meant to be statement. And so we are meant to be a family as a Christian, as a body of believers. If you look at verse 32, really let that word sink into you. They were in the entire group, the entire group were of the same mind. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine that? Everyone, all were the same? That's, I don't even think we're all the same all the time. We're a small group. I, mean, I think we're mighty, but do we all agree all the time? Whew, it'd be a lot. 
Now I say scripturally, yes. About who Jesus is, yes. So I guess we do agree on what they agreed on, yes. The entire group of believers agreed 100%. Heart and mind. Not a few, not one or two, not a few came together. The entire group. And again, I want that to sink in. I want that just to come over you and remind you what that means. A body of believers came together, a full congregation, and fully believed in what was going on. They didn't have one person saying, hey, we're going to do this, guys. This is the right thing to do. Let's go. And then they all just sheep, a bunch of sheeple, and said, yep, let's do it. Nope. They came together, and they fully believed, one heart, one mind. They don't see themselves as individuals anymore. They see them as a body of believers going for one direction to care for his people. The Christians all over the Roman Empire, trust me, all these people from different backgrounds, different races, all here in Jerusalem, all, we'll call it trapped here in Jerusalem, because they're here and now they're believers and they're coming together and they're like, what do we do? The only thing that ties us together is because we're believers. Who are you again? Who's your mom, dad? I don't know who they are. Because you wouldn't know because they don't come from there. They're just believers. They're coming together as a body. The only thing that unites them is Christ. Nothing else. No family lineage. It's not even Jewish history. Nothing. They're probably not even Jews. It's all about Christ unites them. So nothing else beyond that. World views don't even unite them. The same foods don't even unite them. Only about their Christian views about who Christ is. Not even about the emperor, who's in charge, nothing. But these guys 100% agree on Christ. And so when you see this about how they came together as one mind, the entire group, that should say something. That Christ is uniting. He's not one to tear apart. He's not one to tear down. And that should compel us to something. Compel us towards something. It unites. Unites full of grace. So if there's something that's tearing apart, then it's not of Christ. Because there's plenty of things that could have tore this whole group apart, but it did not. See, that statement of, in uh, verse 32, where it says, you know, no one was claiming that their own. No one was claiming their own. It wasn't that no one owned land. Obviously, you've seen a couple people saying they sold their land. It wasn't that no one owned land. It's just that they didn't say, it's my land. Buzz off, get your own. It was saying, oh, you need a tool? Psh, got it. You need a saw and borrow it for three months? Got it. You know, like, Whatever. You, oh, you need to place a pitch tent? Here you go. You need something to eat? I got it. That's what they mean by that. Not, I'm going to sell everything, I'm going to bring it to the Legacy Church, and here I go, buddy. It's all yours. It's, you need something? Got you. That's the heart that we have to hear from the early church. People misunderstand that and like, oh, now i got to go sell everything and Give it all, and I'm going to be just like them. You might miss the point. <laughs> then it was a natural thing that they needed to do that at that time. Now, you might be called to do that, and that, that may be one thing, but like right now, we're all being called to just take care of one another. It might mean that it might just be feelings. It might be financially. Someone might be in financial need right now. It might need us to come alongside of them, but that might be, not be the need that we need to meet. Here's mine. Take it now, if that's what's needed. But what are we being asked to give? Are we willing? Are we willing to step up in those moments where Christians ask us for something, and are we willing to do it? Sometimes it's easy as asking for something they need help with. You ever have somebody asking for help, and you're like, mm, sorry, I was planning on taking a nap. I know that sounds silly, but... 
You ever thought about that? You're like, sorry, I was really planning on taking a nap. You, know, you didn't say that audibly, of course, but, you know, think about priorities, right? Serving the kingdom, serving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, if the same person asks a million times, wink, wink, maybe taking a nap isn't such a bad idea. It's overwhelming sometimes to think about the Christian experience, what it means to care for one another. But that's what we're called to do. Care for one another. Love one another. Show grace where grace is needed. Sell something if that's what it needs to be. Because that's what it means to be a believer. That's what Christ gives the example. That's what the early church showed us as the greatest example of love and care. When you think about that, think about that son of encouragement, right? In the second slide, and I put in your notes there, if the, my slide thing will work, it is son of encouragement, 36 through 37. They called him son of encouragement, Barnabas, but his name was Joseph. You know, He's given a good name, Joseph. It's a, it's a proud name, proud Jewish name. But he was given this other name by the apostles because he was very generous. So before he probably sold his land, he was probably the guy walking around. You need help? You need help? What can I do for you? You need something? Oh, you need, so- you need something? You, you, you. He's probably like Oprah. You get something. You get something. You get something. He's probably that guy walking around, helping out. So they're like, Barnabas, you're, you're Barnabas. You're a son of encouragement. You're the guy helping people out. And then he's like, man, there is so much need out there. He's that guy walking around just, man, I just can't give enough. I don't need this house. I don't need this land. I'm going to get rid of it. Now, he didn't do it out of like, man, I can't wait till people see me. Hey, everybody, tomorrow, 4 o'clock, be here. I can't wait to show you something. Everybody come. Come on. He didn't do that. There's no way this guy did that. Zero chance. This guy went in private, guarantee it. He sold his property. It's hard to sell something to somebody not know, obviously. He sold his property. And he went and put the money at the feet of the apostles. He probably didn't walk away. He probably didn't want any recognition from them. Done. For the people in need. They need it more than me. Guaranteed. And then, you know, the apostles are thankful, of course, grateful for the way that God encouraged him to give generously. So they're thankful for it. So now you see our next passage coming in. And we're going to touch on it just for a second before we actually move there. And you see Joseph, or Barnabas, you see Christians, and he's like, oh, people need help. I'm going to give to them. I don't need recognition. All the honor and glory goes to God because that's where it deserves to be. I don't need recognition. I don't want recognition. I just want to help. Son of encouragement. And then you get our next slide. Sin, consequences, fear. I just say it over and over again. It kind of sinks in. You know, this passage gets used all kinds of things. An unjust God. Oh, wow. Sorry. I've heard a lot of people whine about this passage. How can you serve an unjust God? Just striking people dead. Or look, you know, they gave a lot to the church, but it wasn't enough. Oh my goodness, it had nothing to do with the money. People understand? It was the lying. It was the sin consequences. It was the deceiving. That's the consequences. It had nothing to do with the money at all. <laughs> the, the apostles weren't even asking them to sell. No, nothing about this passage or even the passage before it says, hey, Go sell your property, man. Bring the money to me. Hey, humble yourself. Crawl and put it at my feet, man. All right, that's how you do it. Nothing. Nothing at all. There's, no, there's no, nothing that says that at all. The people were doing it just because they felt like that was, that's what they needed to do. They felt compelled to do that. But when we look at this, they were like, oh, 
That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell my property and I'm going to go do this because I'll be recognized. But just in case this Jesus thing isn't real, I'm going to put a little nest egg back. All right, girl, let's put a little back here. Save this for just in cases so we can still live our life that we've always lived. Just in case. They go and look at us. Here you go. We're, we're good and generous too. Can we have a nickname, please? Yes. Dead. And the reverse, Oprah, you're dead, you're dead, you know. Because it had nothing to do with the money. They were looking for glory, they were looking for honor, and they were trying to steal that from God. Instead of seeking the Lord, and they didn't have to give any of it. But they decided to lie about it and deceive. And that is what caught that up in that portion of scripture and that is a problem that is a big problem when Barnabas sold everything he did it to honor and glorify God and when these this couple man and woman did it they did it to glorify themselves and they got all the glorifying and honoring they're ever going to get and they got themselves dead period it's a look at what they did the wow factor. They got the wow factor. And they got the ooing and aahing because when they got carried out, everybody's like, whoa. I don't want that. So they definitely got remembered. Everybody's still talking about them. 100%. I mean, we're still talking about them. They're famous. Or is it infamous? They're infamous. That's for sure. They are infamous. Still today, they got all the fame they're ever going to get. So they got what they wanted. But I don't think they got it the way they wanted it. Because the Lord killed them both. Peter didn't strike them down. The Lord struck them down. And that drove fear into everyone. And you think about this, the fear that drove into everybody was not a fear of, look, give me all your money. It wasn't a hold up. It wasn't a shake them down. It wasn't a, a turn them over now, shake out their pockets. It wasn't give me your lunch money. It was a, look, just be honest with one another. Be real. This is what I want you to do. Be a Barnabas. If you're going to give, give for real. Honor and glory to God. Be truthful. Now this next slide that I have for you I have two passages I want to kind of turn to. I'll read them out loud, you know, if you don't have your Bible with you. And my slider doesn't want to work, so I'm going to just talk about them. And you have it in your bulletin. So it's not to honor God, but themselves. And I'm using Matthew 6, 1 and John 12, 42 through 43. So the first one is, be careful how we give. That is Matthew 6, 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. I've been doing a lot of research about tithing, not, not because, you know, we're going to change the way we do tithing method, just because it's, just, it's been on my heart lately. It's, it's like been popular in the um, like YouTube field and, and pastors or whatever. Like, I like the way we do tithe. Like, it's just, it's on you. Just whatever you want to do, do it in private. You know, that's the way our model is, where we started when we first uh, came to church, and we were always going to practice it. And there's been an interesting thing about, like, the way that um, other churches in the nation do. There's some churches out there that literally have a box up front, and people dance their way down the middle aisle to give their tithe. And it's like a, there's a song that goes on, and the song goes as long as it needs to go on, and if the pastor doesn't feel like it's heavy enough, like it, that's, let's, let's, let's repeat that verse. And they go longer. And I'm like, I just, my, my brain broke about that time uh, when I was reading that article that I had to like pull up a YouTube and just kind of like actually watch one of these things go on. And I just like didn't understand it. There was nothing about that that was godly or honoring God 
or representing God or bringing honor to him or glory to him whatsoever. It was bringing honor and glory to themselves and their building looked really nice. Be careful not to practice righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. And the same thing about this church, and again, it's not about denomination. I don't really care about all that kind of stuff. But it was interesting because there was like chairs up front and like it seemed like the people giving the most had very particular chairs in this organization. And like they were like the higher ups, I guess we'll call it. They had important prominence. They were called particular names, given proper status because they gave so much. I, just, I don't think I understood that, but I'm fairly certain that all of those people are who is being spoke to in Matthew 6.1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by others. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father in heaven. I just want to make sure that like, when I am go to heaven, I want my reward to be there. Period. Now, on the other side, now I want to be generous here on earth too. With my church, with, my, with people, with society and, and life, I want to be very generous too. So, but I don't have to like, hey guys, look what I did. Here's what I did. Like, I don't have to do that. And then, you don't care, I don't care, because only he cares. It's kind of like, you know, we talk about tithe here, and like, people ask me, like, you know, something about tithe or something like that. I'm like, I don't know, I don't care. You know, like, it's, it's up to you, you and God. And I, I mean that. Like, it really is up to you and God. It's just not up to me. I just, there's no special treatment for anybody. And I really mean that. <laughs> Quite literally. Uh, because uh, tithing is a, is a, a thing between you and God. And it's being generous and, and kind and we'll call it righteousness in front of others. You got your reward. And if we want to bring a big check and we want to put a box up here, like, we'll take the check. Thanks, I guess. But, you know, hey, it's also okay over there. It's okay to donate to a church. It's okay to donate to, uh, oh, I'll plug a preborn in here. Like, hey, preborn's a great organization. You know, it's a great, they do ultrasounds before mothers, you know, go do an abortion. Like, man, it's a great organization. Like, I'd give all kinds of money there if you wanted to. If you want to give money away, give it to them. You know, give it to them before you give it to us, if I'm being honest, because it's a way to save lives, you know, literally. Because, uh, man, I'd rather do that. Give all of our money away in that way, quietly. So that our rewards are in heaven, not here. Because if you glorify it, it will be here. Who gets the honor and glory? And that's where I'm referencing John 12, 42 through 43. Nevertheless, many did believe in him, even among the rulers. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him so that they would not be banned from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praising praise from God. Think about that. Because like a lot of men of that status, you know, they wore the nice robes, you know, status walking around town. People had to get out of their way. I mean, it, it was a big deal. They got a stipend, a house to live in, prestige. Lineage. If they were to leave that, they left it all behind. Their family lost it all. So if they were to leave that and to follow Jesus, they left it all. It's too hard to leave. So they continue to honor themselves and get the praise from people. So instead of waiting for heaven, instead of getting their Reward then, they got the reward as they walked up and down the streets, as the people moved out of their way, as the people begged alms for the poor, 
They got their praise along the way. Where will you get your praise? Where will you get your reward? And I feel like I know you well enough. I know our congregation well enough to feel like I know where we're all on track for. But I think it's a good reminder for us. Where are we getting our praise? Where are we, where, where are we giving our praise? Where are we giving our honor? Where are we giving our glory? Because it's not ours, man. We shouldn't be receiving any of it. It's all his. And I'll lean in the wrap up here too. When you think about wrap up, you know, our challenge in all this stuff, it, it really is that simple. Our challenge is this. We have to clean out any deception. Now think about that married couple. And nice as fire. Think about that couple. On the one hand, it kind of makes sense. You want to have a nest egg. You don't want to give all your stuff. But the apostles weren't asking them to give all their stuff. They could have just said, hey, we sold our land. We're going to keep part of it, you know, because we want to keep part of it. It's our, it's our stuff. And we're going to give you half for the poor. That would have been fine. <laughs> It was that they weren't being honest. They would lay lied. It would have been fine. They were being dishonest. They were deceived. And that was the problem. So we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with what we're doing as a believer. What are we trying to accomplish not only as a church, but as you know, a body of believers with one another? Giving generously with our time and efforts. Think about what it means to have faith that's to the nth degree, that he is real, he, is, he offers so much grace and ability that our ability to care for people isn't, isn't beyond our measure, isn't beyond our, what we can handle. I know there's only so much time in the day, but you know what? I'm pretty sure we can reschedule some things. It means caring for somebody in our congregation. When we think about caretaking for people in our congregation or people in need, when we think about all those things that are necessary in life, we don't have to announce all the great things we do. You know, like when we serve down at the Renucci house every year, like that's a fun, fun thing to do. And like, you know, we, we, we put it on our, our Facebook page, you know, as a church, like we did it, did a fun thing. It was an enjoyable thing. And when I announce it, like, I don't announce it like, look at how great our church is. It's so much. I, I, I said, what a great fellowship we had together. Serving in this way. That, that's it. It was, had nothing to do with like, you know, we served such a great amount of food and it was, cost us this much money and we did such a great job. No. We had a great fellowship while serving. That was awesome. Because it really is. Because it, it, it just, man, our hearts just pound. It's awesome because you're doing such a, you're, you're doing the Lord's work. He gets all the glory and honor. Like that's, that service. And that's what makes me excited. When we started thinking about like, you know, all the dollars you raise and all the, the money it costs to do something, like, you know, that's just irrelevant. But when it's about the joy of serving, that's giving him all the honor and glory. See, Barnabas, we think about him, think about who he was. He had that faith that was just not measurable. He trusted the Lord so much, he took every dime he got from his sale and said, here you go. And he trusted that if, when he was in need, that something would come to him. He trusted in his people so much that when he's in need, they'll come to him. That's what he trusted. That's what he believed. And as Sapphira, what they believed is that they're going to give what they can, what they believe they can, so that when they're in need, they have their nest egg. Big difference. We have to make sure our heart is right with God and everything we do. And when we're serving, make sure we serve with the right heart by giving him all the honor and glory for everything we do. So let's close in prayer, and then we'll go into our sermon follow-up time. 
Father, thank you for who you are. Just uh, grateful and encouraged for all you do in our lives. Father, may you just give us a, a great opportunity today just to have sermon follow time, then our meal time. Father, thank you for just giving us uh, a beautiful day and a, a wonderful uh, breeze through the barn. In Jesus' name, amen.